start. Uh, it is a pleasure to have uh, now today's uh, seminar, Professor Nera Hofer from the Department of Astronomy at the Boston University. Uh, her research interests include the study of astrospheres around stars that are generated by the stellar winds as they move through the interstellar medium that surrounds them. Professor Hofer has had a decorated career, win numerous prestigious awards, and in 2022, she became a fellow at the Harvard Radcliffe Institute. Since 2020, she is the principal investigator and director of the Shield Drive Science Center, a NASA-funded center with more than 40 leading scientists across a dozen institutions around the globe, including the Academy of Athens. Professor Offer has made extensive contributions and service to the scientific community. She has participated with the NASA Heliospheric Mission Senior Review Panel since 2015, served in 2013 Solar and Heliophysics Decadal Survey. She is the editor in Nature Scientific Reports. She was elected to the chair of the, uh, of the American Physical Society, Topical Group in Plasma Astrophysics 1718, and many more. So we are glad to have you with us today. Please, you can you. start. Okay. So this is my immense pleasure to give uh, a talk here. I know um, Tom Kermigis and Costas for many years. Tom, since I was a postdoc in the Dark Proportion Lab many, many years ago. And what I'm going to talk today is about the heliosphere um, of today. And I will tell you a little bit what it is, the heliosphere, and also talk a little bit what we think the heliosphere looked like in the past and maybe how it will look like in the future. So let me start, let's see. It's not advancing. It's not advancing here. It's not advancing. No, it's not Enter. I can advance from here too, but but it doesn't work for you. Yes. What is that? No. No, we don't have. Any... How about Little we stop bar. sharing and share again? No, 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 no. no? okay. Okay. <laughs> Remote, I guess. No, 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 Okay, so I think there is more slide, one more inserted, but fine. Okay, so let me start <laughs> by introducing, um, especially I know there is a lot of astronomers listening and uh, my PhD was in astronomy. So I can um, start by reminding the, the astronomers in the audience that when you look up in the sky and you see stars, and I'm going to use um, my pointer here, but my mouse in the zoom, and let me do like this so they can see. Um, you see stars, you see illuminated um, um, structures like the stars, but you don't realize that Every single star that have a wind, and we think almost all stars have winds, generate winds, they are not static. So they move through the surrounding media, the interstellar medium. So they create a bubble around them. So every single star, when you look up in the sky, it's actually enveloped by a bubble that we call an astrosphere. And they come in different shapes and flavors. Here are some images, real images from the Hubble Space Telescopes. 
and um, other missions of astrospheres of different type of stars. Um, one thing it's important to realize, the winds from stars like our sun are very rarefied. The density is low, so it's really hard to see them, detect them directly with um, um, telescopic images. So those images, what you're seeing here on the, on, oops, in the top, is the shock that is formed in front of the astrosphere. You're not seeing the astrosphere. And in these other cases, those stars are much more massive than the sun. So the wind is much more, is much denser. Um, the other important point that I like to emphasize, we are after another earth analog. We are trying to find life in other planets. So far, we didn't find, we probably in the next couple of years, we will find signals of that. So right now, us Earth or the solar system is the only system within an astrosphere that is habitable. So it's very important for us space physicists and for the astronomers realize what is a, what are the characteristics of our astrosphere that made life possible on, on the planets especially on Earth. So what make our astrosphere habitable? And this is a, a, a baby area that is slowly, slowly growing, but realizing that understanding the characteristics of astrosphere and in our particular, our heliosphere that we have so much data is critical to development of life. And again, I'm, I'm showing different images of different type of um, astrospheres. Um, so, um, as was mentioned earlier, and I will come back to it, I am a director of a NASA center called SHIELD, and we created this a movie for this center that bring home this message, that the planets within the solar system are engulfed by a bubble, astrosphere. This is one idea what this astrosphere look like, and I will come back to it, but it's beyond our, all our planets and it's shield and filter us for material coming from the galaxy and understanding the properties of this shield is critical. Um, I'll come back to it a little bit later in the talk. Um, and again, driving home the message. We know that astrospheres in general and the heliosphere in particular shield us from properties from the galaxy, shield us from dust, for the astronomers in the audience, dust is a, a critical um, uh, component for development of planetary system, for galactic system. And we know that the heliosphere shield, we have measurements of it, I'm not showing here, but it's filtered dust. It's also filter um, energetic particles. And again, for the astronomers in the audience, I'm talking about energies GeV and below. So they are not the highest energy. I have a question. Yes. I will show you next. Um, so it's not the TeV galactic cosmic rays. I'm talking about GeV, but here is the intensity measured from Voyager one since it was launched in seventy seven. And here I'm showing with a mouse the um, intensity of galactic cosmic rays um, in seventy seven. And as it went. And I'm going to use the other point as it went from, from 77 from close to Earth. And you can see here the a distance from the sun. Again, just to remind me, the distance us to the sun is one astronomical unit. So as it was marching and moving through the solar system towards the end of the heliosphere, the intensity went up, down, up, down, and right at the last layers of the heliosphere, the intensity went way up. And right around here, Voyager 1 crossed to the interstellar medium. So the intensity outside the heliosphere, this is the first time that we had a man-made object poke his head outside any astrosphere. And what we measured, the intensity of the galactic cosmic rays was 70% higher than what we measure inside. So this is just a direct proof that an astrosphere shields 70% of galactic cosmic rays. And one of the questions I will come back to it, we want to understand this 
shielding and how it's evolved with time, with space, if it was the same in the past or the same in the future. So we'll come back to it at the end of the talk. And one the other interesting thing to notice that most of the shielding or the filtering happen in the last AUs, the last 20 AUs or 30 AUs, the last layer of the heliosphere is what does most of all the filtering. All this is just wiggles, small wiggles. The main thing is at the end. So, so yes, right, I'm not go going into it, but this is all side. But the main, the characteristics really of the big filter, it's right at the end. Okay, I'll, I'll get back to it later. Um, so I took this slide from Costas. I love this slide. You might have seen it before because I think that slide brings the message that until you know, um, a decade or more later, our, our view of the heliosphere, and he was showing the bubble, was fuzzy. And it's only with the missions that started exploring, and, and I have to say we are starved of data. We don't have enough, but it's definitely the best astrosphere to be studied because we have in situ data. So we had several missions, the in situ data, uh, the one that I mentioned, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, still taking data. Um, we have another mission, um, New Horizons, coming behind. Um, now it's at 50 AU. And we had pioneers that are not working anymore that went toward the tail of the heliosphere. And we have another way of um, studying the heliosphere, so energetic neutral atoms, and, and I will talk a little bit more about that. We have e ENA images from Cassini and from IBEX, and there will be a new mission coming on board in IMAP, taking new images in high resolution. And we would like to have a new mission revisit this area with um, modern instrumentation, the interstellar probe. So, but with this plethora of missions, our whole vision of the heliosphere changed. So, um, before I go on, uh, what are the changes that we, we have seen? I just want to introduce um, some terminology that this is where, here is the sun, the sun has a wind. This, the wind that comes from the sun, it's fast. It's actually a supersonic wind. And it has to slow down as it <laughs> goes and deflect around the boundary that separates the heliosphere from the interstellar medium the heliopause, and as it goes around, it slows down and goes to a shock. We call it termination shock, and it's the largest shock in the solar system. It's around the radius in 100 AU. Um, and then it has this last layer when the wind is slow and denser, and this is a layer that filters the galactic cosmic rays, that does most of the filtering. Um, let's see if I can play this. And one of the things that we always worry and trying to understand the data is the fact that the solar wind and the sun has cycles and the solar wind vary with time. And, it's, and that pushing and pulling of the wind coming um, make the boundaries go in and out. Those boundaries are set by the pressure balance between the interstellar medium in the solar wind. So if the solar wind varies, this boundaries react to it. So it's challenging to understand what's going on in the heliosphere <coughs> because you have vast scales, but you also have temporal changes. Um, one of the ways that we have seen directly is the indication that the, the fact that the solar wind change with time is in energetic neutral atoms those are an, an indirect way, a way I like to think about it is like a tomographic image of the heliosphere. It's a line of sight image of the heliosphere. Um, and you can see here, and this is from Cassini, let me go back, um, that you can see the intensity of the energetic neutral atoms. This is uh, taken um, from Cassini, so there are regions blocked that they were not able to take ENA images. But you can see here in the images that are not black, how with time, those images vary, the intensity vary. 
And you can correlate that with what's happening near the sun to understand that the solar wind is driving these changes in these images. Um, the other thing that we had, and I just want to show, I am not going to go in a lot of details here, but this is a beautiful um, plot. I, I took it from Tom's presentation that show the gallery of what we have in terms of in situ data of particles. We have the particles intensities that come from the sun all the way from seven, 1977 to today, showing all the voyage of the voyagers measuring the variations of intensity that has to do with solar cycles. When the sun is more active, less active, you can see temporal structures affecting the intensity until voyagers entered in the last layers when the solar wind is slow and um, the intensity varied until it's left the heliosphere. So this is like, um, as I said to Costa this morning, we are with our hands like pirates that we found gold. It's like this is um, a treasure of data that I think is going to take many, many years for us to dig in and understand what's going on. Um, one of the questions that um, we can ask ourselves, and I think before the Voyager um, spacecraft left the heliosphere, the idea of astronomers and space physicists that once you leave our home in the galaxy, the heliosphere, forget about the sun, we are in the interstellar medium. And if you open the books of interstellar medium, you're used to seeing a pristine interstellar medium, some warm pieces, some cold pieces, but it's pretty quiet in AU scales. This is not what Voyager is showing us. Voyager left, Voyager 1 and 2 left in different years, but in 2012, Voyager 1 left the heliosphere. And here I'm showing data, showing magnetic field, radio emissions, um, from Voyager 1 from 2012 to 2022. And you see the magnetic field going up and down here. And the radio, there is a radio detector on Voyager. I like to think that the radio detector, you have your radio, you know, the old radio transmitter that is pretty quiet almost all the time. And suddenly you hear in this channel psh, go up in three kilohertz, then quiet, another sound once in a while. And those are disturbances that come from the sun. And it's pretty amazing. The sun has disturbances that travel all the way in the solar system, go into the galaxy, and you can still hear them. And what we are learning that so far where Voyager is, the heliosphere is still active and is still shaking the interstellar medium. We are not yet on a region that you can say the heliosphere stopped dominating. And one of the big questions in the field is how far we have to go to be in pristine interstellar medium. And this is in a global search for astronomers outside of any astrosphere, how far you have to go to stop feeling the influence of the star. Okay. Um, now I'm going to go a little bit of the physics of the solar winds. The other interesting aspect, um, I found it fascinating when I first learned that any star has a wind, it blows a wind, and you can think, okay, the wind expand and get rarefied and fill up the space. Turns out that around 10 AU, this is in distance, you can see here uh, below, but this is in the unit here is in <coughs> AUs, Around 10 AU from the sun, so 10 times your distance from the sun, the temperature of the solar wind, it's hard to say, but instead of falling, like you will expect from an expanding wind and a diabetic expansion, the wind takes a turn and start curving and heat up and stay this 10 to the four Kelvin all the way to the end of the solar system. I'm not showing, but the solar wind until the end, before it goes through the shock, it's 10 to the four Kelvin. Something's happening here. And what is beautiful 
to realize that this is basically the fact <coughs> that the interstellar medium around the solar system is partially ionized. We have hydrogen atoms. We are not embedded in a fully ionized interstellar medium. So because we're in a partially ionized interstellar medium, those hydrogen atoms come in, get photoionized near the sun, and end up heating the solar wind. It's a whole process I'm not going to go through, but they are responsible for this heating. So it's nice that right around 10 AU, way before we left the heliosphere, we knew that we are in a partially ionized and we can sense it. So yes. So this increase, but it stays flat. It's, it's around 10 to the four to 10 to the four. Yeah. <laughs> How far away? And okay, so in this diagram here, oops, here. So it goes from here to here, 10 to the four. Once it's um, cross the termination shock, something else happened, and I will tell you next. So that is really, really cute to realize that winds, and not just solar wind, any stellar wind at large distances are different than the wind that you're used to thinking about close to stars. Um, so something else happened that is related with that that is also extremely fascinating. The wind at large distances suddenly has two components. The hydrogen atoms that come in from the galaxy that are foreign to the solar system, they heat up the wind. And because this wind is not very collisional, it form a second component, a hot component, much hotter than the cold component that come from the sun. So think about a dye. Your, the solar wind come as a blue dye, and suddenly at 10 AU, it start getting a red dye that stays like that. So you suddenly have a wind with two components, a hot and a cold that don't mix, mix very little, and goes all the way to the end of the heliosphere. We call them pickup ions. The, the other way to think about it, though, those are the foreign spies. Those are the, the spies that came from the galaxy. Those are galactic hydrogen that enter into wow. our space physics, our, our solar system, and ended up affecting the solar wind. And what is nice that there are measurements Going back to 95 in Ulysses, this is an intensity in particles. If you're used to intensity versus a velocity, this distribution here is what you're used to your Maxwellian thermal distribution in, in low energies. We're talking here 10 to the four Kelvin that I showed. It's cold, it's one EV. But suddenly this interstellar component form a second second piece. The Maxwellian, instead of dropping, has a knee. And this is around 10 to the seven Kelvin, one KeV, way harder. And we see that all the way, this is near the sun. This is here a New Horizons, 50 KeV, 50 AU. You see the thermal and the hot component. They stay all the way. And one of the thing, that we discover them was from the data of Voyager when we crossed the ginormous shock that I talked, the termination shock. Those are measurements of the temperature. Voyager doesn't have a detector for this hot component. It, it can detect in much higher energies that I will talk, talk in a minute, but though this component around one kV, it doesn't have a detector. So what we measure the detector on Voyager is sensitive to the cold component. So at that time, people <laughs> didn't think about the second component. And the expectation is that if you take all the ramp pressure, all the pressure in the speed of the solar wind, you slow it down in a shock, and the astronomers are used to shocks, you take all the ramp pressure, you transform it to heat. So you take the energy budget from the ramp pressure, you calculate the temperature, the expectation that the temperature from the ramp pressure will go to 
10 to the 6 Kelvin. The measurement is down here by an order of magnitude lower. Was colder. The temperature of the solar wind went to the 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 5. So the question when we saw that, where the rest of the energy? Actually, 80% of the energy was missing. And then people realized we are not detecting this hot component. So one of the interesting thing that this data showed that the hot component stole 80% of the energy. And it's actually in that last layers where all the shielding happened, the main player is not the solar wind, the code, is a hot component. Um, okay, now I'm going to mention some other questions we have, and then I will uh, go into more in depth on some. Another question is, um, we expected that this hot component will, that we call pickup ions, will go, will meet the largest shock. And again, for the astronomers, you're used to supernova shocks. Supernova shocks accelerate particles. So the shocks aficionados saw this ginormous shock and thought, we are going to take those KV particles and accelerate it to MEV and beyond. Here is the data from Voyager before the shock. You know, these pictures before and after. This is before and this is after. This is the data showing here are um, around the KV energy. They should have gone up to this. This, this. That was the prediction, the dotted line, the dashed line. This is before and after, nothing happened here. So if you're looking at the particles, you didn't even know that there was a shock. You just go here, where's the shock? I haven't seen it. So it's a question how these anomalous cosmic rays are accelerated. And Tom is working uh, with Costas and others to write it up. I hope I will see this paper soon because this Voyager data is really, really beautiful. Those are particles intensities. And this is before the shock, the shock is here. So this is where the solar wind was fast. And here is the last layers, the heliosheath, where the wind is slow before we cross to the galaxy. And if you look in this energy band, this is different species, but I'm just going to look at uh, protons. You can see that the intensity in protons, this is different energy bands, um, were not, didn't go up at the shock. It kept going up and up and up as Voyager was deep and deep into these last layers. It's actually peaked almost half of the heliosheath before it became stationary and dropped when we crossed the heliopause. So it's telling us this data that the acceleration is happening behind the shock. This has implications also for supernova. It means that probably some particles in the supernova are not accelerated at the shocks, but behind the shocks in the sheath. So it's not, it doesn't have just implications for space physics. I think it has broad implications for acceleration of particles elsewhere as well. Um, the other interesting puzzle that I'm just going to mention in brief, that this acceleration um, area happened just before we have indirect measurement of the speed of the solar wind. And there is this region that uh, probably Tom talked about this before, where the solar wind in, um, in these last regions went low the speed. And in the last 10 AU of the heliosheath, it seemed that it went to zero. This is really, really hard to explain. Um, so I'm, I'm showing that to tell you that the measurement that we got from Voyager, the in situ, gave us more puzzles than the theory and modeling were able to explain. We are still not able to explain. We're still not able to explain what is accelerating those particles, what is stopping the solar wind here. And I'm going to show you a couple of more puzzles. Yes, please. What is minus the plus in the solar wind uh, block there? Those are speed. With this is speed, this is velocity. So here, so positive is going outward from the sun, negative is going backward. So there's indication here, this big arrow bars, that the speeds of the wind were going back. The 
Right, it's really, that stagnation region is a major, um, ask me at the end, I can talk more about that, but that is a major question. Tom. Mm -hmm. The spacecraft speed has been taken out of it. Yes. So it's, it's just the wind. The flow, the flow speed. But but that that is measured from energetic particles, and we are trying to understand how the energetic particles and the solar wind behave with each other. I'm I'm showing that to to tell you some of the puzzles that we don't know yet. The explanation. Is it a question of frame of reference because? No, no it's not. Out, always out. It's... Why is it negative? Because you have inflow, perhaps. From the intercelular From the intercellular yeah. medium. Yeah. That's the point. Right. That's the right. point. That's the important part. Because and that's the part. Because well, the sun is moving against the space. Right. Yeah. yeah. So okay. the intercellular medium is coming. But you will not expect it. The question is, if you not model, if you model it, you will say that the heliopause is impermeable. Yes. Is a tangential discontinuity, and it's not in this. And it's this indicated it's not. Okay. Another question: If you're kind of Tom knows that, but every Voyager meeting you go there and you hold your breath because you're going to see another data that is going to throw all your thinking um, in a different direction. So once you realize, okay, it's not a tangential discontinuity, the particles are not accelerated at shocks, what next? The other, yes. And I think everybody is that the scale, for example, the scale is reversed. Yes. It's not that you're moving out, you're moving well, in. Well, uh, well, this is 94 from the sun. Yes, yeah, so it's a reverse scale. Yeah, well, I Ah, hello. Hello. <laughs> okay. Sun outward. Okay. okay. Uh, it's it go from here. Sun okay. outward. Okay. Yes. Okay. Got it. Got it. Good. 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 Um, we published this in the American Scientist, where it's a more broad audience from just plasma physics, and we wanted to to make it more representable and understandable. So we decided we would reverse the scale. As and see what happens if you go up. Okay, so now that you realize shocks don't accelerate particles exactly how you expect, tangential discontinuities don't behave as you expect, you have another problem. If you measure the thickness of this last layer, it doesn't agree with any of the models. It's a factor of two thicker. And you remember I showed you the heliosphere breathing in and out? You can account for it. It doesn't, you can't, you have too much energy in the helio sheath. You need to somehow include a sink. Something has to extract energy. Okay, so this is why we have the shield um, science drive centers. The shield was one of, NASA decided in the last years to to their decadal survey to fund a um, couple of the largest science centers that they have is 15 million each. Um, and they selected 30 in phase one and we were downsized to three. And the idea that some centers are going to tackle, you need a center to tackle breakthrough science. When you need um, data people, you need theoreticians, you need modelers to work together. So we put together I'm the director and John Richardson in MIT is a project manager. You can um, check our website. We have lots of um, science and press releases in what, in what we do. And this is a schematic of why it's so complicated and why we need a science center. So here is a heliosphere I showed you. And here are some of the spacecraft that are taking data. Here we're showing the cosmic rays being filtered that we don't understand. And there is lots of interesting processes that we know are playing a role and we don't really understand how they affect the global system. We know that the solar wind is turbulent. We know that there is processes like reconnection. Um, we see this effect of the solar wind in the interstellar medium. And we need to um, put all this together with theoretician and modelers and we put these four science questions to try to understand, at least in zero order, 
how the heliosphere behaves. So we basically behind shield, and this is an acronym, is to create a digital twin, to assimilate what we understand from theory and modeling and be predictive. Right now we are so far from being predictive. I can't tell you how the radiation will look like in 10 years from now or in a different location than the Voyagers. Um, and it's an international collaboration, like was said before. Um, we work here with the Academy of Athens. We also work with Moscow University, with the University of Bern, and we also have collaborations in US. This is a team uh, picture. There's more than 40 people involved. This was a kickoff. Um, I'm not going to mention in this talk the broader impact. We also have a big broader impact effort. Um, it's just a pretty complex team. Um, so let me go a little bit more in depth in one of the questions that we are trying to answer. Not only the questions I mentioned already, but another main question is what is the shape of the heliosphere? And it's pretty basic. If you live in your home and you have no idea how your home look like, if it's a sphere, a round, it's long, you have no idea. This just tell you how little you understand about the heliosphere. So if you Google heliosphere, you will see these iconic images um, that the sun is here, the voyagers, and you have this long comet tail. A um, couple of years ago, um, myself and my group put together that the heliosphere is much shorter. Um, they call it a crescent shape, but this just to, this slide is just to show that the shape is being debated. And if you go back to classic works by Eugene Parker, he was thinking in general, any astrosphere, not just the heliosphere. And he had, this is a hydrodynamic model, an analytic model, <clears throat> doesn't have magnetic field, but he envisioned if I have a wind coming from the star, that the astrosphere that is shown here will look as a comet shape or as a tube, depending of the intensity of the magnetic field that come from the galaxy. So for a weak field, he, he um, solved the equation, then he get a comet. For a very strong magnetic field, it's basically the magnetic field shapes the solar wind, collapses the solar wind, and is tube-like. What happened in the community, that the Moscow group was one of the pioneers of doing the first numerical simulations. This is back in 1993. They, they published the first simulation, no magnetic field from the sun, and they got a comet shape. So then it became the, the, I think the magnetosphere also had a comet shape. It became, okay, the heliosphere has a comet shape. And this is the extra slide. And the first energetic neutral atoms of the tail um, here um, shown by, um, in this paper, Macomas um, et al advocated this is in low, this is in KV. This, this um, maps are very sensitive to that hot component that I talked, the KV. And they look back through the tail and those images show different structures in different energy bands. They interpreted that as variations in the solar wind within a long comet. That was their press release. We have a long comet, the variations are due to the solar cycle. Then came these folks from the ENAs from Inca. And what they noticed that the intensity and in the Inca, the important part to realize, Inca is sensitive to higher energies. So they can see farther down the tail. So they look from this hot component to the tail of that energetic particles to, to 50 keV. And the intensity of the energetic neutral atoms what they found to be almost the same towards the nose and the tail. So their interpretation because of it, that the heliosphere cannot have a long tail, because if not, you will expect much more signal and you're not seeing it. So therefore it has to be a, the region where you get those energetic neutral atoms has to be spherical. Um, 
to the question. Yes, please. The heliosphere contains the material from the solar wind for the past at least five billion years. Can such a model contain the material of five billion years of solar wind <clears throat> in a finite region? Okay, I'm going to tell you the the um. I hope I get to that. The last piece of the talk, how the heliosphere I think look like in the last million years. So I'm, what I'm going to tell you here, what the models right now, what we model is around 600 years, not more than that. Now the solar wind take a year to come here and then it's lower. So it's take around a hundred years to come to the tail. And it's constantly recycled. And it's doing that for five billion years at least. Right. Yeah. So the memory of the helio sheet is an interesting question. If you look here, how long it take to fill up this region? Yes. It's take around a hundred years. So the models should be doing a good job within a hundred years when this wind is recycled. Now, if you go way back in time, and I will show you a result of it, then this whole heliosphere will change. We are driving the models with current conditions. And if the conditions are changed, the whole heliosphere is different. Okay, so we came with a model, not based on the data, we just noticed it in our modeling that something funny was happening in the tail. And this is a nose of the heliosphere, the sun, and this is a tail. And this actually happened from a <laughs> serendipity discovery, and I have to back and discover why, but I noticed that the magnetic field, those are the magnetic field from the galaxy in red, were curving around the heliosphere and entering in the tail. And I was puzzled why, if we had a comet, tail, why the magnetic field was piercing through the tail. Actually, it was Ed Stone and Voyager in one of the meetings said, what's going on there? And I thought maybe it's a problem with the model. Models are hard to handle. I thought maybe there is some dirt there that I didn't look very carefully because everybody was modeling the nose very carefully because of the Voyagers were at the nose. So I started looking here and one of the thing, and um, I don't think I have a slide here, but you can check these publications. When you have a magnetic field and your, the astronomers are familiar with that, magnetic field is like a rubber band. It has tension. So you can try to stretch it, but it will resist. And in fact, the flows in the last layers of the heliosphere are very slow because the wind goes for shock. So that slow wind has the same pressure as the magnetic tension. So it means that those flows are so weak and so weak that they cannot stretch the magnetic field. So they come from the sun, they tried, the magnetic field here is shown in white. They try to take this magnetic field and stretch it and bring the wind to the tail. But the magnetic field, oh, uh oh, said, I don't want to be stretched and they become rigid. And it turns out that the magnetic field become the walls of the heliosphere because the wind is so weak that it doesn't have the pressure to push it. It's funnel very much like if you look at the Blandford method for doing astrophysical jets, it's the same idea. How you extract angular momentum from a disk and funnel it to jets is the same idea. You take the magnetic field, you funnel the flows north and south. So we call it the heliospheric jets. We have in our own backyard, a wimpy astrophysical jets, basically. But the heliosphere, it's basically a case of two heliospheric jets being bent by the winds that come from the galaxy. So you have these two horns, we also call it a sun because it's looked like a sun, but it's meant that the back is not that far. It's a little bit more stretched than the nose, but it's a short tail. Um, 
that confinement by the magnetic field or the, that the magnetic field become the backbone, I'm going to go fast here, but it's seen in other models. One of the controversial we're trying to understand why some models see those jets, but see them close to each other and still embedded in a long comet. So we discovered last, I'm going to uh, skip this. We discovered last year, or two years ago, actually, 2021, that the same Rayleigh Taylor instability that here I'm showing in star forming regions that is responsible for formation of stars when you have cold matter heavy on top of a more rarefied and you have these indentations. I'm not going to go with all the physics here, but inside the helio sheet, we have this scenario. You have cold material along the jets that are surrounded by more rarefied. And so these conditions can happen deep in the heliosheath. And we have seen it as, and this again is driven not by gravity, but by the neutrons coming from the galaxy. And you start forming fingers like really tailored deep. This is a cut of the um, heliosheath. This is the axis of the jets. And as soon, as you let the hydrogen atoms come from the galaxy, the Rayleigh tailors start developing and you see the tail being split. So we think we discovered that the Rayleigh tailor that happened due to the hydrogen is a key, why we have this split tail. So we are trying to understand the development of it and how, um, Again, trying to be predictive if the tail is going to react differently, if the conditions are different in the solar wind. But we think this is a key. So this was a breakthrough, I think, on trying to understand why the helios, why the, the, the tail is not a comet, but it's broken down into it two lobes. Um, the other interesting aspect we're trying to, I, I should, Stop at one, right? So I think I'm going to skip this. I'm going to skip those two um, because I want to go into the last piece of the talk that is how the heliosphere was in the past. I'm just going to show this slide and I'm going to switch gears. Um, you can take the models with all what we think we understand how particles are created in this um, energetic neutral atoms maps and compare with observations. And the other puzzle we're trying to understand within SHIELD and within the community, that they there seem to be an energy dependent acceleration of particles in the heliosheath shown by the maps. It's another open direction that we need to explore. Okay, I'm going to skip this and come to the last piece of the talk. So I give enough time for questions. What makes our astrosphere habitable? So all so far in this talk, I talked about today's heliosphere and you're probably already impressed how little we know. Okay, so now you can ask yourself, what if the conditions were different in the past? And in fact, this is a realization I had when I was at Radcliffe um, in two years ago realizing that the speed that the sun moves, it's pretty fast. The speed that the sun moves with respect to the rest of the galaxy is 18 parsecs per million years. Another, this is around 18 kilometers per second. This speed is pretty fast because if you talked about now astronomical time scale, million years, 18 parsec is the size of the small structures that the sun is surrounded. For every million years, you just go on to a complete different environment. And in fact, people that study clouds like Redcliffe and Linsky around, they only pay attention to structures 10 parsec. These are really, really small more than million years, we're out of all this. In fact, the sun we know from astronomical measurements is within a huge structure called the local bubble, 
that was a result of probably several supernova explosions 14 million years ago. The size of this is 100 parsec. Make the math. Seven million years ago, the sun was not here. So I also came um, in contact with this data and that totally blew my mind and I started working on it. That if you look at isotopes of iron, iron 60, iron 60 is producing supernova. But there is a um, abundance of iron 60 that has peaks. It's a really, really hard measurement to make. You have to make it in um, um, very, very special uh, spectrographers uh, that were done actually in Austria here. And they, by Warner, specifically Warner, and they found that there is a peak of iron 60 around two to three million years ago. And another peak between six to seven million years ago. And those peaks are seen everywhere, not only in ocean samples on earth deep, in Antarctic snow, on the moon as well. If you look at galactic cosmic rays, you see the same abundance. There is a plethora of publications showing the same thing. There are two peaks everywhere. It seems a global phenomenon. So there are many, I'm not going to go to different scenarios to try to explain it, but my view when I saw that, that it seemed that we were in contact with interstellar medium and able to collect this iron 60. Something different happened around two to three million years ago and six to seven million years ago. The other scenario that people try to explain it is a supernova that exploded just outside our shores. It's a really hard scenario because you have to fine tune it because you don't want to have a mass extinction because it didn't happen, but you have it so you cannot explode it too close to us. It has to be a little bit farther away and then you somehow have to bring this iron 60 to us. Not an easy task. So I started looking around when I was in Harvard and I started collaborating, especially with Josh Peak. He's an, one of the world experts on very cold, uh, detecting cold clouds, massive clouds. It's a really, really hard detection. This is an image that he produced for me from a recent survey. There is a new survey I'm going to show you again that he looked, but I was, being a while, I haven't done astronomy. I started looking around within 3 million years. So I took the speed of the sun and I looked around to see, are there any cold clouds that could have affected the heliosphere? And I found this one. That is a funny story because we I wrote this paper and Josh Peake was not part of this paper originally. And he, he got COVID, he got sick with COVID went back and recalculated what I'd done. And he called me up and said, you were right, but it's not the position you thought we crossed, it's here. Mm -hmm. So the, what he found, I thought was some of these clouds of this big structure called the local ribbon of cold clouds. There are very rare, those clouds. It's not that you're going to look in the interstellar media and find them, but HOD found it in 2010, this big ring that move coherently. And especially this center cloud called local Leo cloud is super dense. Just to give an idea, the density outside our own heliosphere is around 0 0.1 particles. This is 3000, is orders of magnitude, four orders of magnitude denser. I was looking for this density because I knew that if you get such density, the heliosphere collapses and then we are in contact with interstellar medium. So what um, Josh helped me, and he was originally, he analyzed in 2011, um, this cloud here, is to get the most accurate speed of the sun that is moving in the local standard of rest in the galaxy, 
and accurately look in the, the most modern measurements that he has. And he took, um, I think I took it out or no? He took, there is a new survey um, that if you ask me later, I can give you the name that he looked in all three, di three directions to try to get the three um, um, velocity of this structure, this global structure. That is the most tricky piece of this work. So he got the three velocity components of this structure. He assumed that this whole structure is moving coherently, what it seemed reasonable because it's a very smooth structure in the sky. And we run Monte Carlo simulations. This is a movie showing that where you can see the motion of the sun back in time in yellow and the motions of realizations of where those clouds were depending on the uncertainty of the velocities. And you can run this movie a couple of times to realize that depending on the, including the uncertainty, the mouse is not working here, the uncertainty here, the sun will cross these clouds. So if it's not 2 million, it's 2.5 million. Somewhere in this range, the sun encounter a massive cloud. So, what I did, this is a heliosphere of today that we are embedded in, in, in an interstellar medium, 0.1 particles, it's, it should be centimeter Sorry. cube, not meter cube. And I went and I simulated the most massive clouds in this structure, that is 3000. The temperature really doesn't matter. What really matter here is the density. And lo and behold, as I expected, the heliosphere collapsed. The pressure of the interstellar medium, when you include all the facts that we know about the heliosphere today, tells us that, okay, I'm trying to find my mouse here. This is a termination shock. It's collapsed to 0.1 AU. The heliopause now, it's a 0.22 AU. So Earth was completely exposed. So Earth was here. So in 3D, you, you have a long comet shape. That instability, I told you, cannot play a role here. And I there's a physical, I explain in this paper why. So you have a long comet shape, but it's very thin. And this is a three dimension of the heliosphere. Sidewise is the rotation axis of the sun. The Earth's trajectory is in red. And here from top, the Earth is poking outside in the interstellar medium for most of its trajectory. So not only Earth, but all the other planets were unprotected by the heliosphere. I'm not going to show you because I didn't have time. This other work, when I realized that I started working with Alisa Goodman and Catherine Zucker, those are the world experts on this local bubble. And they had published in 2022 the best model of the local bubble showing that all the star forming regions are in the walls of the local bubble. Star forming regions are dense regions that have density equivalent to that massive cloud. So I worked with them to get the, again, the best velocity of the sun, the best, this is an expanding shell the best the expansion of this velocity. And lo and behold, we got that the sun enter into this bubble. I don't have a movie now to show you here, but I, um, um, I have this in this paper that the sun entered this 7 million years ago. So when we simulated it, the sun collapsed not to 0 0.2, but the pressure was a little bit stronger. So earth was outside but the, he the heliosphere was at around 0 0.7 AU, still collapsed, not as at the first one, but still collapsed. So it's meant, so this is a compositive picture that we put, it's consistent with these two peaks of iron 60, that three million years ago, the sun was in an environment that the heliosphere didn't filter radiation, didn't filter dust, we collapsed. 
and then it went back to the regular heliosphere we are used to and then collapsed again. So we are trying to push this story that there are times in the <laughs> heliosphere when the heliosphere collapsed that cannot protect us. And we would like to understand the implication for life. What does it mean? So here are like three slides and I'm done. We are trying to first look the consequences. What happened when you don't have a heliosphere? You're based in very massive hydrogen for the climate and for the radiation. So this is work I'm doing with uh, Maria Hatsaki here in the University of Athens with my postdoc, Jess Miller. And we're working with this uh, Mark Hervik. He's an expert on the mesosphere. And we are trying to revisit old works. That try, there's only two works in the past that look on the climate implication if the earth was exposed to massive amounts of hydrogen. This was um, a 1D um, a calculation, very beautiful, uh, but it's back from 78, the best that they had at the time. They predicted that in the mesosphere with this amount of hydrogen, you will produce a global clouds called the mesospheric clouds that will cool down earth. Um, we are trying to revisit that with modern climate models to see if this is correct and what is the effect on the climate. One thing I'm not mentioning this talk, and I just showed here, this is a beautiful story too. You can know the temperature that the earth had in the past from these little creatures here. Those are called foraminifera. Those are creatures that can be scooped at the depth of the ocean and if you measure the oxygen ratio, O18 to O16, it's very sensitive to temperature. So those shells capture those ratio of O18 to O16 with time. And the shape of these shells capture what was happening at the time. So you can map, people that study the paleoclimate on earth use those shells to tell you the temperature of Earth going back 60 million years ago. So we know that there was some cooling and we would like to understand maybe it had to do with where the heliosphere was. Um, so this is something we are working. Another issue that I mentioned right at the beginning is the radiation. The heliosheath <clears throat> shields 70% of these galactic cosmic rays. There's another piece that is shielded shown here from the magnetosphere. The Earth has a magnetic field. So the question you can ask yourself, if we are in contact with interstellar medium, we don't have this shielding anymore. And you can ask what will happen with the magnetosphere. So the only thing keep in mind, this is my last slide of future work. I haven't done it. We know radiation and there is important for exploration in the solar system. There are people like Kusinota looking at the effect of radiation from galactic cosmic rays for mutations of cells. We would like to understand when we were exposed to higher radiation, what happened to Earth? This is a new direction. We are not there yet. I'm just showing a future direction we would like to go. So, I want to leave you with the last message. Not only we need to understand the heliosphere with efforts like SHIELD of today, we need to understand curves like that to show the temperature in the past of Earth and understand to the extent to which Earth history has to do with the location where the sun was in the interstellar medium. Because depending where the sun was, we were unprotected. Thank you. That's what I do with the Voyager team. Yes. Many, many thanks for the Thank you. Talk. <laughs> Lots uh, to cover. Uh, yeah. uh, I think there, there are several questions. Uh, yes. Uh, let, let, me, let me put the, 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 uh, the scale a little bit. Now yeah. We know that uh, the sun is located uh, at the feature we call Orion Spur. Yes. But we don't know if it is just entering or it is embedded in that. 
Right. Because this would make a difference in whatever we discuss here. So it's something that is encountered for the first time, but it is a, a, a sequence of uh, such clouds that will be encountered, or I'm not far away. And the other stuff. piece that outside the local bubble, this is yeah. something I'm talking to um, João Alves um, here. He's one of the collaborators here. He discovered a couple of years ago the Redcliffe wave that is outside. He was also a Cliff Fellow, and he discovered with them that outside of the local bubble, around the time where the sun would be 11 million years, on the, <laughs> on the direction, there is another very massive region of star forming 11 million years ago. Mm -hmm. This seems to be consistent with what we saw, the isotope of iron 60, the isotopes can only go to 10 million years. They don't have the precision to go back. But so, so, so far we are looking seven and three that we have the iron 60. But you can imagine then that going back in time, there will be other occasion where the sun, yeah, yeah. didn't have a heliosphere. Sure. Yeah. In your interpretation of paleontological data, you have to first take into account the evolution of the magnetic field of the Earth. Also. And of the Sun. Yes. Before dismissing them as the origin of these effects. It, it, it seems to me like order of magnitude, the most important is the magnetic field of the Earth, then the Sun, and then the interstellar medium approaches. Of the Earth. So the evolution, okay, so <clears throat> you can correct me. My understanding of the evolution of the, when you include how much the sun was more active in the past, it's still fine. You still have, it's not going to stop the heliosphere from collapsing. The pressure, when you calculate the pressure of massive 3000, even if you crank up the solar wind intensity, it's not enough. That is work that I've seen by Brian Wood calculating how much more intense the magnetic field will be. And what I'm talking about, the magnetosphere, maybe Earth had a magnetic field, I'm not dismissing it, but you have a magnetic field coming from the galaxy. So you can imagine that you had lots of occasions to have reconnection and opening it up. But even if you want to say it didn't happen, you didn't have reconnection, we have 70% more radiation just from the heliosphere. Yeah, this is either come that, uh, the if you need the heliosphere has collapsed, um, even the size of the magnetosphere is going to come off the head, off my head. It should make a lot of difference because the gyro radius of these particles, the GVs, are, are so large that the scale of the magnetosphere is tiny compared to the, their ability to uh, hit the Earth and yes. embed themselves in the system. Right. So, so really, the, the collapse of the heliosphere is really the, the principal event. I think so. Right. And of course, we know that the magnetosphere also does go, as you know, uh, the north and south pole versus, and you go to periods. And one of the interesting things I realized when I started looking, I took out the slides from here. But when I started giving talks to paleoclimatologists, they always take into account the Milan Milankovitch cycles, yeah, that yeah. the axis, yeah. and they get this is in 10,000 years. They never think about where the sun was on our scales, on yeah. millions. They don't account it at all. Yeah. It's news for them, the heliosphere. But yeah. You don't really know where the sun was. You have a paleontological measurement, and you want to interpret it as being the collapse of the heliosphere. You really want, so you want, you want the... us to believe that the sun entered this very dense region. Uh, very well miss it by you know a few parsecs or it something. It could have. So, the... could. Yeah. so you have a data point in the data, this iron 60 right. isotope, and you want to, ex to explain it with this. If indeed it entered that region, yes, the heliosphere would collapse. If it not, 
didn't enter that region. There are other ways to oh, absolutely. for this increase. A absolutely, absolutely, yeah. The only thing we can do is to put our best foot forward with the error bars that we have of the velocities. Mm -hmm. What we found, what we showed here, um, I passed it, that with this is, uh, you, you barely can see it, that this is um, one sigma, we crossed it. So it's really probably we crossed. Mm -hmm. This is statistically the best we can do. Mm -hmm. And the other piece we are trying with the climate is both in three million and then in seven million, get the best quantitative we can do to the effect of what happened when you have 3000 particles per centimeter cube on a modern atmospheric models. Of course, climatologists have other interpretation it, especially three million years ago, lots of stuff was happening on earth. And they try, they have, it's not quantitative the model either. It's stories, but they are trying with their stories to try to explain a cooling that you see in these shells. One of the climatologists asked me if you can do it at 7 million is better because less things happen on earth. So if you can show that an effect of that had, I don't know how many degrees, it would be hard for us to, to describe it with something terrestrial. So this is vision for the future. We are far from being, quantitative to the point of proving it or ruling out other, but that is. And you can always invoke a supernova that exploded. That, million years and seven million years and 10 And years. then you had the exact that dust exactly. and you were able to bring it and right. You can always, yes. Our questions, maybe, maybe we can check, check the participants. Now, Okay, I don't see any hand reason. Uh, reason. So if someone wants to ask, just speak up, please. No, then thank you again. Can we just close it now? Close? Yeah, we can close it. Close it. The critical point is that we stop the recording. And meeting for a 